Welcome to what we were originally calling Barstool Perspective, but then we ran into some trademark stuff and we decided to call Bruce Guy's Booze News. Although that's now in some discussion. We're shopping it around, so if you have any ideas, write them in the comments yeah. below, because we're taking all yeah. ideas. So for now, to avoid all copyright infringement, I'm Mike Morgan, he's Johnny Knoxville, and this <laughs> is Jackass. <laughs> Cheers. <laughs> Well, Mike, this week we have some good news and bad news. Yeah. The good news is we're not starting with Bud Light. Oh, that is fantastic <laughs> news. The bad news is Anchor Brewing, venerated brewery of 127 years. Some might say the first original craft brewery, which if you're curious to know more about, is it the yeah. first, is it not? Check out the Bruce Guys Happy Hour podcast where we're doing an oral history of craft beer. And we interview Fritz Maytag, who brought Anchor back. Yep. Anchor ceasing operations, closing for good as of a day ago. That is incredibly sad. And um, yeah, not to uh, pimp the podcast too much, but I have been thinking about that episode three where we interview Fritz Maytag mm -hmm. uh, a lot this week because one of the things... And, and we're going to record a new ending to that episode three, actually, to update it. But we ask Fritz if he thinks that selling the brewery, if taking it public mm -hmm. and selling it, you know, to a large behemoth impinges on the craft of the beer and, you know, changes the quality of it, changes the spirit of it. And he is very optimistic at that period of time that we interviewed him about two years ago. Of course, he also got a check with more He's zeros on it. He's financially obligated could. to be optimistic about the situation. Right, right. Yep. Even said he was drinking Sapporo these days. Mm -hmm. um, you know, which we didn't make fun of him for because it's very gracious for him to talk to us. And um, he's 80-something. He can drink whatever the fuck he wants. But, uh, yeah, you know, I, I would love to be able to have an honest, frank conversation with him right now to know what he's feeling about how these greedy pieces of shit destroyed America's first craft brewery. He's got to feel not great about it. Yeah. Like, this was the dude's legacy. He, mm -hmm. he cared so much. He bought yeah. a distressed asset. Yeah. He spent so much time, effort, hours fixing this brewery up, chasing these souring demons out of the brewery to make clean beer again, right. building a style that didn't exist in America anymore, reviving yeah. the history of the San Francisco gold rush era and turning it into something that was a top 25 brewery at one point in time. Mm -hmm. Even when he sold, they were in the top 50, I believe. Like they were making yeah. a lot of beer. And to see it all go away at his age too, which, you know, obviously right. we're not 80, but I've heard you get a little, you care a little bit more about your legacy and shit when you're getting closer to death. He may even be near 90s at this, he, or early 90s at this point. He, I mean, I think he was 88 when we interviewed him, and that may have been two years ago. Not to digress too much into how sorry Fritz, but uh, at, yes, at any rate, he's not going to start a new brewery. Mm -hmm. He's doing other things. He's doing cool stuff. I mean, he sure. he he has some creamery. He's doing stuff with bourbon and cheese. Well, you get an 85 million dollar check, and you can do whatever cool shit you want to do too. Right. But uh, and I will just as soon as it comes in. But uh, it, it does have to suck, you know, to to have built something that was so iconic. Mm -hmm. And the first thing that, which which one of these asshole companies is this one? Uh, I always forget. So story. Sapporo bought Anchor in 2017. Okay, is, but is Sapporo actually the parent company? Yes, Sapporo is the parent company. And the first stupid thing they did was to change all the branding on it. And branding, so what? But... That gets you some short-term gain in sales. You know, people say, oh, what's this? Or there's something different about this beer, and it's the packaging. Yeah. I think it's really stupid to change the branding on a product that has had the same branding since it became, arguably, and again, like the first episode two and three of the podcast, we debate this, uh, whether... You know, Jack McAuliffe with New Albion was the first American craft brewery with was Anchor Steam. Regardless... What was arguably the first crap brewery in the United States, it had had the same branding since 1965. I mean, it was really iconic. Everybody recognized that beer. Even if you hadn't drank it, 
you knew what that beer looked like. So to screw around with that branding, that label that has lived that test of time, that was stupidity evidence number one. Then they recently uh, stopped this stopped distributing beyond well, the state of California. Let's talk label for yeah, a second sure. first before you go further. You disagree? Well, to a degree, yes, but no. There is a difference between keeping an iconoclast of a label and refreshing it a little bit. Brightening yeah. some things up, maybe tweaking some things, simplifying, adding complexity, whatever, versus a total rebrand like they did. Total rebrand, totally crazy. Uh, 100% agree with you there. But if you want to see the increase in sales, which is all they were doing, was driving short-term yeah. sales, you can still refresh it a little bit, clean it up, maybe brighten it, make it a little bit more applicable to get rid of that the seal, though, the anchor seal. Like, why would you do that? Yeah. It doesn't make sense. Well, yeah, and possibly to refresh, to jack up sales so that they could leverage it with, you know, maybe the predetermined intent to just tank it after they'd well, see, tempt now, it for, you know. No, I like what this. I like this conspiracy here. Because, <laughs> like, you have, a, you have a bottle shape that no one really uses. You have right. a small label that no one really uses. Yeah. And you have color schemes that no one really uses. Like the yellow, that old washed yellow. Yeah. No one really uses that on beer labels. So even if you don't can't read an anchor bottle from across the room, you know it's anchor. Yeah. And then you pick it up and you can get all the information. So maybe maybe they did try to tank it. Maybe that is yeah. maybe that is the plan here. Like buy it, well, tank the anchor brand and then keep the brewery in assets. Well, and tank it after you have taken all that you can take from it. Yes. You know, pump up sales because they talked mm. about when, when they killed this brand this last week, I was looking at some of the numbers. 2021, they had a 45% increase in sales. Mm -hmm. And then last year they had a 10% decrease in sales. And then in 2023, they said, oh my God. Well, we just, it's just not sustainable. You know, we can't make money on this mm. brand. Two years ago, you had a 45% increase in sales. Really? You know, it's really gun to the head in 2023 as Sapporo. Bullshit. I'm calling bullshit on this whole thing. Yeah, maybe some of that 45% uh, growth was based off of the rebranding and that short-term fucking pop. Perhaps. But it's hard to say. I'd love to know how much money they borrowed after that. 45% increase. Well, to throw a little bit of gasoline on this conspiracy fire, Absolutely. because I really Absolutely. like this actually conspiracy yeah. of the rebrand was done to long-term tank it. I so, like just doing some hate well, on Friday. <laughs> <laughs> Bruce Guy's hateful Fridays. <laughs> uh, they, they've been fighting unionization efforts and the union that exists at Anchor as well. They, they've been tanking the negotiation process. So there's another thing that's been happening these oh, yeah. last couple of years. So you kill the union. They bought Stone Brewing Company in 2021. Yeah, oh, that's such fantastic news for Stone. Well, they paid a, like double for Stone than what they paid for uh, Anchor. But this ties into what I read and heard through my sources. Granted, these are secondhand rumors. Mm -hmm. What I've heard is that what Sapporo wanted was a U.S.-based domestic production of Sapporo brands. So they didn't have to import Japanese brands. They could just make them in the U.S., save on shipping. Yeah. So what I heard is... and that the Anchor Brewery was getting renovated and they were trying to bring it up to modern standards for Sapporo so they could start cranking out volume. Apparently the Anchor Brewery is has the capacity for like 4X what they were doing this past year. And so they were trying to get it up to steam for Sapporo production and they just couldn't get it there. The brewery's too old, the building's too old, the automation wasn't working. They were basically slowly rebuilding the whole brewery bit by bit. So it got to the point where they're just like, screw it, Stone's a good value right now, we're gonna buy Stone purposely run anchor into the ground because stones just it's already ready to be our domestic production facility yeah and boom here we are where we basically tanked anchor because we bought it realized it wasn't going to work and we made a mistake and rather than selling it back to somebody who's going to take care of it they just pow, sunk it which at the end of the day is why we have these conversations that we have it's why we do the podcast it's why, I mean, this show is broader. This is all alcohol. But our love for craft beer 
I mean, yours started before you became a brewer and actually mm-hmm. own a craft brewery. It's not just the beer. You know, it is the fact that craft beer is about small businesses. Yes. And when it ceases to be about small businesses, it loses its soul like everything else. So, um, that's a you that's know, a really good point. It's yes, brewing is science and manufacturing, but you can yes. still have art, romance, and soul in those processes. Right. It's the craft, right? The craft, the craft, as some like Germans call it and stuff. It's not. It's that's not because they speak German. It's so. not craft in the <laughs> the box. <laughs> <laughs> this just in German speak German <laughs> it's, when craft beer was bastardized the word craft by corporations it, it lost its meaning and the, the, to me the original meaning was just putting your heart and soul into small business capitalism and making something that you love that you can share with people that hopefully love it too yeah. and it's enough to support you and that went out the window as soon as Sephora bought them apparently yeah uh, so they to get back to where you were saying a couple minutes ago, they pulled back national distribution earlier this year. Mm-hmm. Like two weeks later, they said, eh, we're not making Christmas ale either. Too much work. Yeah. Too much work to add spices the to a beer. The first seasonal beer in modern American beer history. An amazing, amazing product. And every year it's not the best. Some years it's bad. Other it's years it's amazing. Season. But it's just such a beautiful, romantic thing. And then... As of this week, they filed bankruptcy and ceasing all operations. Now, my understanding is that they are liquidating the business assets, which basically means that the equipment's going to be sold off and the brand assets will be sold off separately. So there's an opportunity for Bruce Guys to buy Anchor. Yeah. Right now, Bruce Guys can't buy around. But if you guys <laughs> would like to help, if anybody wants to buy Anchor Brewery. Yeah, pitch in. We'll get this thing going. We'll buy some Anchor. We'll brew it here in Cincinnati. We'll ship it to San Francisco. It'll be weird, but you know what? At least it's not going to die. Or you know what? I'll take the hit and move to Northern California. <laughs> <laughs> oh, no, don't go. <laughs> <laughs> Only for enough money. I can't afford a closet in San Francisco. Now, normally we do the question of the week at the end of the episode, but it really applies to this story, so I wanted to throw it at you now. And please... Answer your uh, answer to this question as well in the comments below because this is going to be going. With the loss of Anchor, if you could pick any brewery in the United States Mm -hmm. that you could give landmark status to and that it would never be allowed to close, the government would keep it open no matter what, what brewery would you pick and why? Wow. Um, It's a great question. If you have more questions, hit us at info at brewsguys.beer or comment. You know, there are some regional brands that I have actually never had shell beer out of out of uh, mm-hmm. southwest mm-hmm. Minnesota. Mm-hmm. But those guys have a fantastic history. They were on death's doorstep and they came back um, post COVID. I really want to punch anybody that says the word pivot, but they did beautifully pivot <laughs> to uh, craft beer production from just being a regional. Mm-hmm. So, you know, they do regionals and they, they do what's supposed to be good craft beers. It's relatively localized distribution. Uh, it's, but you know, there are breweries like that, that are of significant mm-hmm. size and, and vintage and importance that I think, uh, are, are meritorious of that. Sam Adams. I mean, mm-hmm. we talk, I, I've got, I don't mean to, you know, always be um, worshiping Sam Adams because they get the flaws. D of SA. Exactly, <laughs> but um, it would really be a, a terrible day, a sad day, if they were acquired by a larger multi-global corporation. Oh, like Heineken that's looking to have an aggressive takeover of Sam Adams, which is the rumor going around distributorships right now. Yeah, that would really be a sad day. I mean, because then yeah. we would not have as an as a nation. As a nation that has been one of the biggest beer producers in the world, and you know, thanks in large part to our German immigration patterns, uh, you know, with Germany, I, I I think that United States craft beer, along with you know uh, the UK and Germany, the United States has been really respectable in its beer industry, and even 19th century. So the fact that if we lost Sam Adams, 
we would not have a single large scale beer manufacturer mm. in this entire country. That would be a sad ass day for the United States as a nation. Well, we still have Sierra Nevada. We lost yeah. New Belgium, which is also in the top three mm. there of crap breweries. We still have Yingling. Yeah. If you care about that. <laughs> I, man. Yeah. I mean, on paper, I do. Yeah. We, um, we don't need Sierra to Nevada. Anymore. Sierra Nevada is a good. And I mean, the crazy thing, we, we also interviewed uh, Ken Grossman of Sierra Nevada. Mm -hmm. And that's also, that was a fun episode. The crazy thing about Sierra Nevada is not only are they still privately owned, they're still family owned. I mean, they have th that huge brewery that they opened up in Asheville, North Carolina. That is run, to my understanding, predominantly by Ken Grossman's son. So it is still, although it's a huge business and, and they are richer than God, uh, it's still entirely a family business. So Sierra Nevada also, uh, they're, they're pretty sacrosanct. So what I'm hearing you say in that long answer right is <laughs> very rambling yeah is really we need to break it up almost by regions and then each region gets yes. their own landmark brewery yeah which i would like to nominate great lakes for the great lakes region as the brewery of choice for me uh, you could probably argue bells yeah but oh yeah i'll take great lakes because oh, bells is already dead well that's true they're gone so yeah. great lakes boom yeah. stamp of approval and mm -hmm. you know if we're yep. gonna if we're gonna get small regions and we say the ohio river valley is a region I'm going to nominate myself, Thurman Artifact. Yeah, sure. That's why one night. Yeah. Anyway, great You story. wouldn't because really you want that huge-ass check. <laughs> <laughs> this episode will be revisited when AB InBev offers Brett $10 million. <laughs> <laughs> That's true. Uh, anyway, let us know what is your landmark brewery in the comments below. I'm really curious to see what you think. Now, we're going to switch on to some more news here after we uh, are done. Well, we're not going to be done more than the death of Anchor, but we're going to have yeah. to move on. Nor bitching. That's true. That will happen for weeks to come. Mm -hmm. The most liked beers, according to a new YouGov survey, are... Can you guess the top five? The what? What? Most liked beers. Most liked Not the beer. most drank, not the most profitable, not making the most money, not selling the most volume. Just what's the most popular beers? They called people up and said, hey, what's your favorite beer? Hmm. Um, I would assume that the vast majority of those are going to be mass brewed mm -hmm. and they're going to be correct. the shitty ones that people drink. So Bud Light's probably not falling off that list yet. Uh, Miller Light, Coors Light, uh, Mick Ultra. All four of those pieces of shit, which are the same bad beer, they're on that list, right? Uh, they're not in the top five. Wow. Yep. So the top five, which... This top five kind of makes me pause and, and think about how the hell this was even done in the first yes. place. Top five, Guinness, Heineken, mm. Corona, Sam Adams, Blue Moon. Bud Light was number nine last year, number 14 this year. Here's the thing about those surveys. And it is a really fascinating piece of non-booze history. Diet Coke tastes like Diet Coke because the guy that formulated it took all of this market research and ignored 100% of it. <laughs> and he did that because when you survey people and you ask people how they like their coffee, do you like a bowl rich coffee? Do you like a medium roast mm. coffee? Do you like a coffee that's watery as hell and tastes like McDonald's? The vast majority of people will say, oh, I like a bold, rich coffee because they think that's what they're supposed to say. Yeah. But when you actually look at what they drink most of, it's shitty, watery McDonald's like coffee. Yeah. So I think that the explanation of that survey is not that that many people are drinking Guinness. It's that they think that's the beer that I should say I like. Well, you know, the Brewers Association did a survey with hop flavors about four or five years ago, and it was the same thing. It was, what do you say you like? Mm -hmm. And then they gave them a whole bunch of different IPAs that have the different flavors in them, and yes. ranked what you actually like. Mm -hmm. The flavors that you say you like ranked the lowest on what they actually liked. Right. So like piney, dank yes. flavors, those all fell at the bottom of the list, but they're at the top of the list of people who said, said they like them, but they actually don't. Mm -hmm. It's one of the big problems with polls. Even when you get into political polling, mm. there's a variety of flaws in that, but it, it shows up everywhere in polls. 
that people will answer questions based on identity and what they think they're supposed to like as opposed to what they actually like. People don't want to have to have their own opinions on things if they Correct. don't have to. Correct. As uh, we have uh, discussed privately, you know, I have a thing where, like, if I like something that then becomes popular, I have to cease to like it. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, that's not how most people operate. Yeah, I like to tell my wife that I've been ahead of trends for the last 20 years. Yeah. But, you know, I don't know if that's true or not, yeah. but it's fun to pretend. I usually have been, but then when that thing that I like becomes trendy, fuck that thing. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not, no, I'm not doing that again. I'm not doing it. I'm not drinking it. I'm not eating it. Whatever. Fuck that. It's dead to me. Well, now that people, now that douchebags like it. Well, Bud Light falling. Speaking of douchebags, uh, Bud mm -hmm. Light falling down from 9th to 14th is interesting in that it shows us. It, it shows that the popularity waning matches what the data is showing. And another thing that's popped up on social media about Bud Light is that the star of death has been applied to Bud Light in Costco. And if you're not familiar with the Star of Death, it's an asterisk mark put next to the price tag of an item showing that this is gonna get discontinued and no longer be at Costco stores anymore. <laughs> so the Bud Light is now getting the Star Ooh. of Death. Is Bud Light Ooh. dead in Costco? Ooh. Ooh. That would be major. Uh, do we know the July 4th data yet? It is still too early to say. We're still getting Father's Day data, so we trail a couple months or a couple weeks, so it'll it'll be a little bit while longer. Which this was a great Father's Day for drinking, by the way, it'll up big time as far as alcohol yeah. sales. So best Fair. best Sunday in years, apparently, as far as total alcohol sold. I if I had kids, it would always be a great Father's Day to drink. So speaking of, speaking <laughs> of stars of death, <laughs> speaking of stars of death, uh, there's another new fad that's coming around. Yeah, beer tanning. It's where. <laughs> I'm for it. That's <laughs> where you you pour beer on yourself and then you go outside god. and tan. <laughs> oh my god! Uh, you know there was this guy. There, it's a thing. I've seen this. I know they're in Europe. Like the the beer sauna. Yeah. And yeah, like yeah. It's, it's like a hot tub full of beer. There was sure. somebody that was going to do one of those here on Cincinnati, and it didn't happen, or it did and went bankrupt in a week. I don't know because I didn't care. But. Um, yeah, I don't know. I mean, just drink your beer. Shut up. Uh, <laughs> Buy some copper tone. Dr. Katarpal said, why would anyone do this? <laughs> Direct quote from the Cleveland <laughs> Clinic doctor. Because uh, alcohol is so good for the skin. It, uh, it basically gets sticky and then sunburned. Yeah. <laughs> sounds it terrible. Sounds fantastic. You remember uh, Do you think it draws sunning? bugs more? <laughs> just covered in bugs yeah. and burnt? But like, uh, you mean like a sphincter whitening. No, no. Uh, you remember that trend, like from five years ago, where you would like lay down and pull your pants down and put your butthole right up against the sun, basically. Uh, no. <laughs> well, I've, I've had, but I. This strikes me as like tank not, tanning. I've not been invited to your parties. <laughs> Gets real weird over at our house. Yeah, I think that was just a trend at your place, man. I don't think... Uh, Maybe it wasn't even real. Producer I, Adam told me about it in the I, first place. I, <laughs> Maybe he just wanted to take his butt off. I think the guy that brought a bunch of mushrooms to your house one day <laughs> is the one that came up with that. Maybe it's really a cat. Uh, I've had my sphincter uh, whitened, though. I <laughs> that was a thing, too. It was a fad. Don't... It's, look it up. I mean, Google it. <laughs> the images will disturb you. <laughs> uh, so going back to shitty things, Bud Light, mm -hmm. uh, it looks like it's finally stabilizing at about negative 30%. Yeah. So we're going to sit there. So they don't drop it more. They don't expect it to drop more. However, a former AB InBev president of operations said, quote, permanent damage to the brand has occurred. I do not expect it to return. I could see it getting worse, but potentially not. So, Do you think maybe it just stabilizes at being priced the same as Bush Light. I think it's a value brand now. Yeah. Yeah. I think you're right. I think it's it's gone to value brand territory and it's going to be a slow decline yeah. over the next 20 years. You're not going to come back from that. It's not like you're going to jack up the price of uh, Bush Light and retain the same consumers. You're not going to lose all of them. But if you start if you start pricing Bush Light, if a year ago you would have started pricing Bush Light at Bud Light prices you would have lost some uh, yes. purchasers. Generally, going sales. down to a sub-premium product pricing means you're toast. Your brand, yeah. your brand's ruined. Yeah. 
Uh, They're still around. Yeah. That bet I made with my neighbor that Bud Light would die. I mean, I made it because I was drunk. But I don't really think that that's going to... I don't think it's going to happen. I think that they're just going to become a permanent budget brand. They're never again going to be in the top three. Yes. It's not dead as in it's going to be gone forever, but it's dead as in it's not nearly going to be the powerhouse it once was. Right. I mean, not even Schlitz is dead. Yeah. Some of these brands. They're not ever going to be the second biggest beer in the world again. Yes. So uh, we're running a little long. I'm going to jump to a couple more topics here uh, that are a little bit more weird. So in the news of the entirely obvious. The butthole whitening? (laughs) <laughs> okay, that's a good point. Well, in the news of the entirely obvious, uh, a new report shows North Korean dictator Kim Jong Un eats mm-hmm. and drinks expensive ass shit. I <laughs> who would have known? Now here's some good quotes for you. Quote: There is no limit in how much he is willing to spend when indulging his taste for mm-hmm. the finer things in life: high end spirits, fancy cigarettes, and oh. imported meat. That's a direct quote from the UK Defense uh, Ministry. Yeah. Uh, well, most of his country is starving, so there's, you know, extra stuff. He is a, quote, inveterate boozer, spending mm-hmm. as much as $30 million a year on booze, bringing yeah. in the most expensive imports he can. And this is according to import data from the Chinese General Administration of Customs. Yeah, that sounds great. He also imports Parmahan and eats Kobe beef regularly. The dude's speed running gout. You know what was a spectacular idea? The Korean War. It's worked out so well. <laughs> I don't know if you have anything more to add on Kim Jong Un eating his eating his way into an early grave, but he's doing it. No, I watched that documentary about the two women that were tricked into assassinating somebody for him in the airport. Remember that he he killed his uh, brother, had his brother assassinated uh-huh. in an airport by two women who thought they were doing a reality TV show. It's a whole, it's a really fascinating I have story. not heard this. It was, yeah, yeah. Oh, that's wild. Yeah, yeah, it's a, it's a, it's a crazy story. It, same thing's probably going to happen to us. Because uh, they were set up, I mean, they were led to believe that, like they were doing a reality TV show. Sure. And they did all this innocuous filming and stuff that wasn't funny, but that was its biggest crime. And um, it was all a setup so that they could be duped into assassinating somebody. It, so it's possible that's what's happening with us, really. Well, that that's like Adam has somebody that he wants to assassinate, and I'm sure that it's not even going to be anybody interesting. That's why he's training us to stick our bottles up to this guy. It, yeah, only you one of us. Can't defend yourself when your legs are above your head. Once again, only one of us. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so more news that's bad for the rich: expensive fine wine. What? <laughs> They're the best people. <laughs> I thought you'd like this. Uh, expensive fine wines as an investment, are doing very bad. Oh, no! <laughs> Next you're going to tell me they overpay for art! Oh! Oh! <laughs> what I like to do with my fine wine investments is drink them, bottle yes. my piss, and then resell it. <laughs> that sounds like a great idea. Recycling. <laughs> you know, this episode has gone far too much down a rabbit hole of bodily fluids and how did we go from anchor into butt and pee stuff? Started out really classy. It just it degenerated really did. completely. Um, our non alc story of the week: mm-hmm. the Screen Actors Guild has joined the Writers Guild in their strike. How will Robert De Niro eat? <laughs> it's really more going to affect uh, working actors like ourselves and not working. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> uh, you know, this is a thing. I've been thinking about this story because. The vast majority of, of actors are poorly paid, mm-hmm. um, De Niro aside. And at the end of the day, although it, it's the same basic beef that the Writers Guild has, in this idea that you know you can be poorly paid to do a job, which okay, you agree to do the job, but then your adhesion contract is going to let billionaires infinitely reuse and retool the things that you have done in ways that were not possible before now. Mm -hmm. So that, you know, you are, you're being screwed out of 20 advanced jobs because you got paid to do one that they're now using really cheap technology to just cut up and reuse in all sorts of ways that wouldn't have been possible. I don't fuck goats. But if I said something like, 
I love goats. I love Bach beer. It's the fucking best. Yes. That might be able to get cut up yeah. into saying... Then you show up in a commercial saying, I fuck goats. If you have goat-related venereal disease, like I do, yeah, buy our products. Right. So, like, we wouldn't want that being reused, cut up. Now, you know, me saying, I fuck goats, you have actual audio of and video of at least twice. But, um... <laughs> There's a point in there. <laughs> Bruce guys, the goat fucker podcast. <laughs> yeah, I support their cause. Uh, but, you know, it is, I mean, the ripple effect on this, you know, you know who's paid as bad as the lowest paid actors and writers, the grips, the production people, uh, the people that wait tables at restaurants that serve the crews where they shoot a lot of movies, which isn't just LA anymore. You know, Atlanta has a big movie scene. Cincinnati actually uh, mm -hmm. has a lot of, of films to get produced here. So there's a ripple effect th that's going to hurt a lot of people. And at the end of the day, that doesn't mean that I'm opposed to it. I support the actors guild on this. I support the writers guild on this. And I think that, um, you know, Harvey Weinstein's ilk needs to just understand that they can live on only a billion dollars a year. But I mean, it's, it's going to hurt a lot of people. And starting with the fact that you're not going to be able to watch, you're going to have to re-watch The Wire like four times in the next year. There's not going to be anything left. Well, I'm okay with that. It's better than any re new reality television shows that's going to come out with a bunch of scabs. Unless it's Bruce Guys. <laughs> Well, we're not union, by the way, <laughs> and we are for sale. We're kind of cheap. That's true. Your name here. Mm -hmm. uh, as always, comment, like, subscribe. Any questions you got, uh, really hit us to us on this YouTube channel. That's the best way to get a hold of us. But if you like email, send us an email at info at bruceguys.beer. If you like snail mail, even mail us to the Urban Artifact mailing address, which you can find on maps. Uh, check out our other podcasts wherever you listen to podcasts. Mike, anything else to add or plug? Cheers, bitches. We love you.